So the definition of a sustainable site is it promotes land development and management practices with our future in mind. Mm -hmm. So sustainable sites generate less waste, minimizes impact on the landscape, and use less energy, water, and natural resources. Welcome to Home Green Homes Podcast. I am Izumi Tanaka, a green home advisor and a green realtor. Here I invite a variety of experts in the world of green homes and have conversations about how we can all live in healthy, resilient, and efficient homes. My guests provide insight in a wide range of topics from designing, building, and living in green homes, purchasing or financing green homes and improvements, to how we can live to reduce the negative environmental impact from the way we live. My goal is to inspire and inform you about how we can make a difference in our own lives and our environment. Hi, this is Izumi Tanaka with Home Green Homes Podcast. Today I have Brandon Carlson. Uh, he is a, a senior applications engineer with Alum Energy, which is in itself is a very interesting company. And I want to have him talk a little bit about that. But today we really want to hear about what he did to his own private home. Um, so thank you so much, Brandon, first of all, for being here with me today. And if you can just briefly tell, tell me about what you do for Alum Energy and what Alum Energy does. Sure thing. It's a pleasure being here. Thank you for having me. So my name is Brandon Carlson. I'm a senior applications engineer for a company called Alum Energy. Uh, they specialize in designing and manufacturing a solar piece of equipment that works with low-income multifamily buildings and splits one large solar system into many tenants. It's done uh, through some special wiring and uh, is uh, really working out pretty well in the US. We've only been in the United States now for about a year. It's an mm -hmm. Australian company, uh, but there's there's always someone with multifamily building that needs solar, so especially in the low income realm. So uh, been at the company for about a year. I've been in solar and energy storage industry for about 25 years. I'm also a C10 electrical contractor and an ICC E5 electrical inspector. So uh, I've seen the industry grow from a little acorn all the way up to what it is up today. So you've seen the industry grow and and unfold in, your, in front of your eyes. That must have been really fascinating. But yeah. like I said, today we are going to talk about your home. So tell me about your home, where you are, and um, how long you've been there. And I know you have a very interesting history with your family legacy. So tell us, tell us about that. Sure. Um, so the, the house I'm at, uh, I've lived there since about 2012. Mm -hmm. I am a little east of Los Angeles. I'm in Riverside County, a smaller town called uh, French Valley or Winchester. Um, it used to be Winchester and it slowly unfolded into as developments come in to into mm. uh, French Valley. Um, so it's a little north of Temecula, if people know that with the wineries. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. My father started in the solar industry in the 80s, and that's where I got a lot of my <clears throat> my passion for working with sustainability. Um, he worked for the California and UCR reserve system. So anyone working on their PhDs go out to these facilities that are pretty remote. And it's it's um, many, many miles. We're talking some of them 100 miles from a road, let alone a utility line. So at the time, they were really trying to find a way to have people have lighting, have small refrigerators, you know, just some very essential loads. Um, out there in these remote locations that had been built originally without power. Um, so he went through and as he was building structures with uh, individuals, um, they looked into solar at the time. And at the back in the 80s, there was very few people installing this stuff mainstream. So when my father started doing it, there was five individuals, him being one, in California that were actually started a company doing it. Um, so he got... He, there wasn't a lot out there at the time as far as uh, information, you know, um, 
we talked about, you know, there was really no books being written, very few um, educational resources. There was no classes. Racking really wasn't a mainstream thing. So you kind of designed your own racking um, and saw what worked. Everything was lead acid, standalone systems as far as off grid. Um, so that's with all of my youth spent with my father working alongside him for my summers. Um, I really appreciated the isolation in those remote areas. Mm. And I realized really quickly that, you know, you have a small refrigerator and that's it. Uh, you have to make sure the cupboards are kept clean and stuff for, for rodents and, and anything else yeah. in those remote locations. And if something went wrong with the power system, you you had to fix it. <laughs> so, <Right. laughs> so listen, you really couldn't call too many people out to help you. Yeah. Um, so it really got me to appreciate living sustainably, mm. kind of off the grid. And what even if you're living interconnected to the grid, what you can do to better prepare yourself in case an incident occurs. Um, I do have uh, a slide deck presentation that I put yes. together. Um, yes. I know that some of your people can't, uh, your viewers can't actually see, but are also listening for, mm -hmm. um, as a podcast. So I will do the best I can to explain yes. what we're seeing <laughs> as we go. So um, let's talk a little bit about it. So mm -hmm. the agenda, I'm going to go over the primary goal with the property, uh, yeah. introduction to the property. And then we'll talk about, as you and I uh, were speaking about originally, electrification, mm -hmm. how people can do so for residential uh, properties. Um, I'll also talk about my well for my water, the septic, which is my sewer. And then a little bit about California Native Landscaping, which I've, I've learned quite a bit while I'm out here. And then finally, mm -hmm. some areas of growth for the future of the property. Yes, yes. I love that it's way beyond just decarbonization or sustainability. You know, you are looking looking more into regenerative. Yep, and yeah. uh, even before I knew this this term existed, uh, mm -hmm. sustainable site, mm -hmm. um, I was already kind of following down that path. Mm -hmm. So the definition of a sustainable site is it promotes land development and management practices with our future in mind. Mm -hmm. So sustainable sites generate less waste, minimizes impact on the landscape, and use less energy, water, and natural resources. Um, you could probably think of some of the earth ships that were built out in the desert and you know, right. back yeah. in the 70s and 80s. Um, so an introduction to the property, uh, it's located in Riverside County, as I mentioned. It's two buildings. It's a barn that was originally a small dwelling for when the original builder, who was a mm. general contractor, was building this house. He um, him and his wife, I believe, uh, lived down there before they had kids. Um, so it's slightly shy of eight or slightly shy of five acres. I think it's 4.94. Mm -hmm. um, two acres I've decided will be used for native landscape. Mm -hmm. um, it's fully electrified with energy storage. So there's no gas on site, including propane, and no utility interconnection aside from the negative electric bill. The reason mm -hmm. I chose two acres is as I've lived out here, and even before when I used to visit out here, there was nothing. And now uh humanity doing what it does uh, has a big <laughs> and there's housing tracks all around which is okay the problem is a lot of the native plant population and animals don't really mm -hmm. have where you know much area to go to still so i decided to take two full acres and kind of just leave it wild do a little maintenance with it you know clearing out some stuff and maybe putting in a a pond but um, everything else will stay uh, native with California native species that are specific mm -hmm. to my zone. Right. So here's uh, some pictures of the site. The black yeah, line yeah. you see around the property is my property line. Mm -hmm. as, as you can see, uh, my fence goes a little north over the property mm -hmm. line. I that see. wasn't my doing. <laughs> the original property owner had a, uh, a spiteful fight with the neighbor where he was under the impression, trying to use zoning laws uh, on his benefit and built a small tree house on the northern side of the property and then tried to claim that land as his. Obviously it didn't work. Uh, the neighbors are very happy with me though, since I do maintain a lot <laughs> of the roads around my tractor and we're slowly working on moving that fence back towards I the see. correct location. I see. <laughs> so you can see there's a lot of open space in front of the yeah. house and a lot in the back. The back mm -hmm. is 
pretty good being natural. I'm trying to redo mm. that area as best as I can. Mm -hmm. The front area um, has been a passion project of mine because nothing was growing there originally aside from a few trees and very, very uh, small amount of weeds. And mm. the reason for that is when they're building a lot of the neighborhood, they were dumping excess concrete into ah, that. Ah, I see. And uh, so not only were they messing with with the uh, elevations of that land for, for mm. issues of drainage, they're also just throwing waste, which wasn't mm -hmm. allowing anything to grow, which mm -hmm. is pretty unfortunate. So it's yeah. slowly adding more soil up there, um, planting some good uh, native species that will slowly make that soil come back. And mm -hmm. it's been since 2012, I, I started doing pieces of this. Um, so over time, it's really gotten much better. Um, mm -hmm. And I really started planting this year. Mm -hmm. um, the top right photo is a picture of this small area over here under the tree. I do have I quite a bit of grass still remaining. Mm -hmm. I'm still mm -hmm. removing sections to plant fruit trees. Mm -hmm. But this is one area I will keep because um, I know the kids love running around in it. But yeah. also, it's a great entertaining area with some some null grass that. Uh, yeah, really... I can see that you have a party set up over there. <laughs> we did, yeah. That was, uh, I think, it was Mother's Day. We did. Uh -huh. But uh, yeah, and when it's not a celebration time, uh, I've got my hammock out there and barefoot mm. <laughs> uh, barbecue out there. Sounds um, good. <laughs> so right below, you can see a, a picture of that first structure, which is the barn. And then mm -hmm. the part of the larger house with a wide shot of that grassy area. Mm -hmm. So electrification. Yeah. So when I moved in, the property was in really bad um, shape. It was in drastic need of repair. Um, the staircase for the barn was collapsing. The house was built only in 1990, but there was a lot of shortcuts taken by the original mm -hmm. builder. Mm -hmm. So um, when I looked at uh, replacing a lot of the main elements, elements anyway. I'm a firm believer in reuse as much as you can. Mm -hmm. But if you can't reuse it anymore, it's time for replace. That's when you make the upgrades. Right. So for cooking, uh, no propane anymore. Uh, we've got an electric range, electric oven, and an electric grill. Mm -hmm. um, it's unfortunate because as someone who enjoys cooking, um, <laughs> my spouse and I... Uh, I had to get used to an electric range. Right. Not the same as an open flame, but mm -hmm. you're going fully electric. That's your only yes. option at this point. Yes. Um, I, that's 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 where I hear hear a lot of pushbacks from people who love to cook. They want to they want to have fire, you know, that's yeah. that's visceral, right? Yeah. Think, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but you can still use like a, a charcoal burning you mm -hmm. know, grill and stuff for the, for those times that you really want to where yeah. the food will. Um, so I do have three water heaters on site. Um, mm -hmm. There was two when I moved in. There was a third space for one, but when the mm -hmm. bank owned the property, um, before I purchased it, someone had come in and ripped out that water heater. Mm. So I ended up replacing all three. Um, two of them ended up going out on me about two years into living here. So it's mm -hmm. time for them to be replaced anyway. Um, Two of them are electric tankless water heaters, and one is just a standard tank electric water heater. They mm -hmm. use quite a bit of energy. Mm -hmm. um, looking back now that I know as much as I do about um, water heaters in this realm, um, I think I'd go more of a heat pump for the future mm -hmm. rather than yeah. you know, water heater. I, I was very curious about why you chose tankless, electric tankless water heater as opposed to heat pump. Oh, well, it actually <laughs> turned out because depending on where it was on the site, mm -hmm. a tankless water heater is very good if you use very little hot water. Um, you don't use right. it very frequently, right? Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. the thing's not saying they're continuously being right. heated when you're not right. using it. So right. my tank water heater is mm -hmm. on the side of the house where the showers are, where mm -hmm. the master bathroom you know, sinks are where mm -hmm. people are brushing their teeth, where they're taking showers. Mm -hmm. uh, the bath is on that side, but anything mm -hmm. that's like a dishwasher, washing machine, mm -hmm. maybe one bathroom sink is on mm -hmm. a different one. And at that mm -hmm. point, I switched over to a tankless mm -hmm. and the other one just has a few sinks connected to it. And those right. aren't used very frequently. So, right. you know, maybe once a day, 
for mm -hmm. half an hour mm -hmm. while those tanks is being used or the water here is being utilized. The other mm -hmm. one is, you know, four hours. Right. Day, so mm -hmm. see. Different. Yeah. They do take a lot of energy though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so for energy efficiency, I knew with my site going fully electric, I wanted to pull out all the stops as far as being inefficient in other realms because I knew I'd be using more power on site. Mm -hmm. So at this point, I went to um, energy efficiency for LEDs um, for all the lighting. Uh, for my air conditioning and heating, I started putting in a lot more split systems. Mm -hmm. um, so even areas where the family would or would not gather is still a good idea to use a split system because if they're mm -hmm. not, you can not heat or cool that area. Right. But for right. always times in there, you can usually turn off the, the main house AC right. and run that room. So it actually mm -hmm. works really well. I think a more, mm -hmm. as things progress, I think more and more houses will start going that route. Um, mm -hmm. All their entertaining areas versus the yeah. big open. Right. Open concepts never going to really go away, but I think you'll get a lot more smart on how they design it. I agree. Mm-hmm. And then uh, for my well, because I am on a well system, I do have a variable speed pump for the well. Um, that helped a lot with my starting surge. Uh, mm -hmm. And the reason that I wanted to address my starting surge for that small peak of power is mm -hmm. the next section. So I've got my solar system, which is a 25 kW ground mount. Mm -hmm. um, it's just the right size for me where I don't have any electric bill. And then mm -hmm. for my energy storage, I have a pretty large energy storage system it's yeah. because i'm you know as an electrical you know, <laughs> working as an applications engineer in this yeah. field and right. electrical contract that specializes in renewables this yeah. was already uh, my bread and butter so it was very easy for me to <laughs> design my own system and build my own system sure. so not sure. everyone will be in that boat but right. uh so 38 kwh system will give me about 64 amps of continuous output which is a lot um so i can have if I want to, I can switch a, a few things around and then have my well run off that energy storage mm, device for as I long see. as I need to. So I, I have see. my pump that trickles water in very slowly. I have a massive water tank, which I'll show a picture in a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. I have my booster pump. And I'm mostly concerned about the well and the booster pump, that power you know, fluctuation when each one's going on. Right. right. Now, you with all these electrical um, appliances and... Uh, even the water heater, you are still generating enough energy with your solar panels, right? Yes. So you're net 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 zero or net positive. Oh, you're net positive. I'm net positive. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty good about knowing when to uh, when to use loads and when my max mm -hmm. production see. is happening. Yeah. Um, but also, I with that big of a system. Even in days where I'm like, it's very rare, but if I'm having a, a party indoors and mm -hmm. it's very warm, right? I get and it's a beautiful day. Sometimes I'll even leave the it's, it's terrible, but sometimes I'll even leave the windows open a little bit to yeah. let you know that airflow through, uh, right. especially if everyone's just so compacted into a, a house right. setting. Um, but I have the ability to do that because I run so negative uh, mm -hmm. after the production goes through. So that's so great. Um, it's 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 a first world problem on that. So. Yeah. Yes. Um, but you can see how much power we actually use. So this is one of the tankless electric water heaters. You can see on the right it's set to 160 mm -hmm. for the water. On mm -hmm. the left, you can actually see how much power. Now to the untrained eye, um, this doesn't mean much with the numbers here, but 240 volts, which is a single phase, mm -hmm. uh, dealing with on on you know a regular residential house. My amperage is 150 amps. That's three 50 amp breakers, which uses a ton of power. That mm. for the average home service panel, it's anywhere from 100 to 125 to 200 amps total right. of service power. You know, right. for utility. Yeah. But this is using more than 50 percent of that by a great. Oh. Right. In, in some cases, over 100% if you have a small service. So this mm -hmm. uses a lot of power. It's not for everyone. My service mm -hmm. is a 400 amp, so it's much mm -hmm. larger. So I have the ability to pull that amount of power quickly. I but see. if I was anything smaller, that's when heat pumps start making a lot more sense. Right. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, here's a photo of my ground mount solar system mm -hmm. and my energy storage devices. Well, some of the energy storage that you see there. Um, mm -hmm. I've had this system up and running now for a little over 10 years. Oh, um, wow. the storage, I did sw swap out at one point. Um, my dad and I ended up going through and swapping the lead acid system mm -hmm. out for this kind of all-in-one lithium iron phosphate, um, which uh, has been working absolutely wonderful so far. Right. So what is the reason that you put the PV array on the ground as opposed to your roof? It's a good question. Um, for one thing, I have lots of land. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's um, true. <laughs> that I have quite a bit of shading on my property. Oh, well, uh -huh. so mm -hmm. I have eucalyptus on one side and then uh, I think it's a camphor tree on the other side mm -hmm. that really shades during the, the peak moments of the day. Oh, so, I see. I didn't want to take down those trees because we get a lot of birds of prey on my property. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of nesting of, of different species. Yeah. I actually yeah. have some prairie falcon, um, mm -hmm. which are endangered. Um, so I, there was, I didn't want to remove that. I also, you know, putting it on a uh, comp roof isn't difficult to do. Mm -hmm. I thought as long as I've got the space and there's no shading and I eventually yeah. want to swap out some things go a little larger in the future, uh, do some, some testing with it. Because in my line of work, I constantly test with stuff like this. So yeah. there's times where yes. I'll just hook that system up to a, a, a standalone unit. And I see. Run some numbers. So uh, well, I'm, glad you <laughs> I'm glad you didn't cut the trees down. <laughs> well, I am too. Originally, yeah. there was one tree in this spot. It was a old magnolia tree, but it mm -hmm. had, um, it was, past its prime and it was uh it was starting to erode you mm. know coming into the concrete ripping up stuff and then mm -hmm. um was leaning very heavily so yeah. i was like well might as well just nip that in the butt now yeah i see all the infrastructure so here's a the tank that was the propane originally you can mm -hmm. see that yellow tubing there mm -hmm. and you can see behind that's the old water tank, uh, which ah. I've, com I've completely um with i'll show you a photo later on here that should those uh the new water tank but i i shopped around as far as anyone that wanted to tank this old tank um for recycling mm -hmm. no one wants it so i'll have to cut down myself and take it into recycle oh recycle really somewhere. <laughs> uh it's it's a chore i'm not looking for to do yeah. um here's a picture of my well uh mm. you see a little um i've got a camera set up on it just you know, if anyone were to be out in that part of the area, mm -hmm. you know. my property is not, it's fairly remote. And sometimes you get uh, people wandering by. So I always keep uh, some cameras going when need. I see. But you can see and, the water tank there. That's that big green one is much larger than that other silver one. Right. Yeah. Saw. Yeah. Now, so this is your own well. You don't share the well yeah. with other neighbors. Correct. Everyone in the, the uh, neighborhood has their own well. Oh, interesting. Uh, and they sometimes have to be redug. Re We've had a few this season only because a nursery mm -hmm. uh, moved in next door and has been playing. Oh, uh huh. Um, so a <laughs> few people are getting a little nervous, but uh, everyone's mm -hmm. on drought tolerant landscaping. Um, we, we allow, you know, so much water to come through our system, but we're also mm -hmm. are very cautious about making sure certain neighbors who have livestock and horses and stuff get right. there. Share, right. So. Now, who monitors the water quality? Do you have any system in place to make sure that the water doesn't contain too much nitrate or like? Um, my property sits um, where the blue line actually runs is pretty close to where my well is. Uh -huh. And that line there behind me has a pretty good size hill, uh -huh. um, probably about 70 or 80 acres. Right. And that has no construction on it so it's oh, okay you know there, there's there's no one building up there. there's no one dumping um, i see in fact even to get up that hill you'd have to access my property to even get up there I so see. i'm not terribly worried about it. that being okay. said mm -hmm. um i do have you know we'll go out and test it about every five years just to make sure i see mm -hmm. i check inside the tank um mm -hmm. probably about twice a year just to make sure mm -hmm. there's nothing 
growing in there or right <laughs> smells yeah. and, mm -hmm. but i also took the liberty of planting uh you know some pepper trees around it which mm -hmm. really shapes it as well so mm -hmm. you know it's it's kept at a pretty constant temperature i see it doesn't get really hot and then really cold back and forth i too. see yeah so uh what you can see here is my septic system mm -hmm. so uh the image on the left is my access point to the mm -hmm. south side septic tank. I have two of mm -hmm. them. And you can see mm -hmm. the leach lines run out into the fields. Mm -hmm. um, they're actually mm -hmm. pretty good for fertilizer. Um, yeah. Just downstream you get, you know, they really yeah. help with the, the plants yeah. growing there. And uh, on the out outskirts of the property is some orange trees. So mm. uh, all that slowly leaks depending on the slope of the hill. towards Sure. The Sure. Um, septic things are great. Uh, you don't see them in new construction nearly as much as mm -hmm. uh, you know retrofit old stuff. But um, I like them because the tanks are fairly expensive to originally put in, mm -hmm. but they only need to be cleaned out about every you know five to ten years, depending on how mm -hmm. many people are in the house and how often you're using them, how yeah how good you are about what you're you're cleaning with or what you're flushing. Right. But there's no cost. I mean, it's You've got water from the well that feeds into your sinks and toilets and showers, and mm -hmm. then goes right into the septic and clears out yeah. a lot of the septic. And um, you call in a truck, it's about $700, although it might have adjusted for inflation, about <laughs> every seven to eight years, yeah. which seems like a lot, especially when mm -hmm. you have to do it. But you also have to remember, you don't have a sewer bill, yeah. right? So at this yeah. point, I don't have any water bill. I have no sewer bill. I have no electric bill no. aside from yeah. an interconnection fee. Um, so it's, it saves you a lot over the course of a year. <laughs> so some, uh, native landscaping, uh, mm -hmm. you can see my, my pots. This is just from the last two months. Yeah. Planting. Wow. You planted a lot. I, I planted a lot. Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> so the, the, the pots you see on the left, uh, that was a barbecue that I used mm -hmm. for just my mm -hmm. workbench outside. Mm -hmm. But um, the more species I'm adding, the more butterflies I'm seeing, uh, yeah. the more moths I'm seeing, the less mm -hmm. mosquitoes I'm seeing, less flies. Mm. I'm bringing a lot of um, more of the native uh, insects around, and they're pushing out a lot of the uh, annoying ones, mostly because um, the predators follow mm -hmm. those species over. Mm -hmm. and. I've, I've noticed a big shift. Uh, the kids absolutely love all the butterflies we've been seeing. I've probably, since I planned this last year, I've probably tripled the butterfly population. Oh, that's, that's amazing. That was my goal is to get a yeah. lot more. Um, so you can see some of this, the plant species. These are mostly mm -hmm. uh, flowers here on the right. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be planting a lot more of those in the spring. As far as um, what's on site, I have a lot of brittle bush and buckwheat. So you mm -hmm. see this stuff here. They're absolutely mm -hmm. beautiful. Yeah. Um, they are what we are used to in Southern California, seeing all around, you know, unless you mm -hmm. get to those. Um, they don't make a lot of mess, which is great too. And they're, they're fairly decent against fire. There's going to be a mm -hmm. lot more stuff out there around yeah. my property. Yeah. So here's, uh, was my phase one. This is why I planted this summer as far as trees. Wow. Uh, look at I that. I can go through it, but you can really see the mm -hmm. length to pull different species every tree i plant every every bush i'm looking into i go wow. through you know, watered where's its temperature range mm -hmm. that it's gonna die back because of the cold where am i gonna plant as far as shading um and i go through this like someone would for a regular flower garden yeah. um uh, there's a, a website called cowscape which is wonderful absolutely wonderful free website to go to and you can actually drop in a pin of your exact location with your address right. right and then it'll populate the plants native to that point in california so a lot of these i pulled originally from there um but i want to see okay what would be here if my house was never built and no one developed in this area what would the native species see yeah. when they're coming out to the site that they'd want to you know roost in or or um you know, pull seeds from uh, pollinators. The only, um, I do have a few plants I planted this year that are not to this exact location native. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm at a preload altitude. I'm about 
1100, I think. I did pipe, uh, put in some Jeffrey Pine, which is mm. for the Idlewild Big Bear area. But yeah. Um, yeah. I have a lot of barn owl on property and I have one great horned owl and I mm. wanted to give him somewhere. If he's going to be this far uh, <laughs> into the desert from the mountains, I was going to give him a place to hang out and maybe. Yeah. Just... What was the site name again, Brandon? Uh, that's Calscapes. Spelled Cal just Scapes. Mm -hmm. C A L S C A P E P E S. Yep. Okay. I will put it in the show note. And then you go to it, each plant you click on will also show you. Um, it, oh, it's so great. It'll also show you, uh, it'll do a PDF printout of, or Excel spreadsheet printout, depending mm -hmm. on what you, how you want to save it. But it'll also say, okay, well, this is what kind of pollinators use it. This is what, you know, animals use it as a host plant. This is what's right. great to plant around it. You know, this, this is how often you should water it. So it gives you a whole wealth of knowledge with some pictures. So I, I highly recommend anyone that's getting more mm -hmm. into California mm -hmm. native landscaping. Yeah. Looking. So with the arrival of the native plants came more critters. And before I move forward in the slide, I do want to say, I'm sorry that there are critters that um, are usually a little more scary to people, but... Mm -hmm. <laughs> Usually I, I take a picture with a new species on site. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. these are the ones I had saved because I just did a, a little bit of a lecture on rattlesnake catching. So, mm. uh, so here's a few of the critters oh. I've had in the last uh, probably six quarters. So the last year and a half, um, different species. A lot of snakes. <laughs> yep, a lot of snakes. Um, they're loving whatever is uh, attracted to whatever I'm planting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, living oak um i've got some willows um lots of pepper trees mm. that were here even before you know i started planting um i have a whole plethora of scrub oak um mm. coffee berry you know all those things attract the native populations and native populations include squirrels mice mm -hmm. yeah, right kind of exactly so the snakes <laughs> are sure to um and i did have some great caterpillars this year and mm -hmm. uh all tarantulas a lot of them. Yeah. Right you see them down there on the bottom left. That's on my. Yeah. So, um, unless they're uh, venomous, if they're venomous, I um, I remove them, take them over to another location, and dump them uh, where they can go live their life that way. I know that there's something said where you don't want to dump snakes in a new habitat because they don't do very <laughs> well. But we do have a lot of horses and a lot of children in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. The last thing we want mm -hmm. is a rattlesnake. Mm -hmm. So don't kill them I just relocate them to better pastures yes <laughs> <laughs> areas of growth so where does this leave me now well mm. I'll tell you one thing I've got a lot more planting to do so sure. um, probably you know probably 10 hours a week worth of planting um, wow I try to stay pretty physically fit and active with it so I enjoy it it's gardening um instead of with you know some roses I just use very large wow. scale uh, native right. species trees and shrub. So wow. I do want to put a weather station here because it does get pretty mm -hmm. windy. Uh, mm -hmm. And I want to start looking right up because I don't know of a weather station very close to me here besides me. Mm, I see. Uh, planting phase two will be shrubs since I just put in all the trees this year. Mm -hmm. uh, planting three, uh, planting phase three will be a lot more wildflowers. So mm. uh, I just ordered in a bunch of seed. Um, they're all mm -hmm. native to this particular valley. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then eventually Nature Pond, which I, mm -hmm. since it rained recently, I got out in the tractor digging mm -hmm. a new spot for it. And then yeah. eventually I want to play around with a wind generator. Um, mm. I know they're not too popular right now in, in our neck of the woods, mm -hmm. but um, I got some great wind. <laughs> on <a> note, <laughs> they want to put yeah. This yeah. That kind of leads me to my last question, though. I know yeah. you you recently had to evacuate because there were fire. So what are the some of the measures that you are taking? I mean, obviously having na native plants and the way that you're designing seems like it would be much more resilient. But how about your structure and and you know um, the the your property around your structure? Is there yeah. anything specific you're doing for fire resilience? So the first thing I did is I, I do have a box scraper on the tractor and I do mm -hmm. clear out an area away from the house. Mm -hmm. It's not a big area, but it's probably right about 75 feet. 
Mm -hmm. 75 feet to 100 feet. Um, I also don't plant anything that's more than a foot tall within 50 feet from the house. Oh, wow. So everything, all the trees that I do, I mean, you have to worry about roots anyway, depending on the species you're planting. Right. But everything else goes, um, you know, further away. I do right. have some grass that I mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. I'm leaving that grass specifically mm -hmm. around the house as an extra mm -hmm. barrier. And that's mm -hmm. watered pretty frequently. So it's, mm -hmm. it's nice uh, green. And I then see. all the uh, plants that I do put in, I put in a drip line. Mm -hmm. It's a very light drip line. Mm -hmm. But the goal is, since it was a clear area before, and I am adding plants, mm -hmm. I want to make sure that there's no dry spells. So right. even with the now the California native species, mm -hmm. having a, a drip line, um, running it once a month, you know, for mm -hmm. a day, mm -hmm. will go a long way. Obviously, you don't yeah. want to do it in summer because it can, can really mess with some plants with their regular cycle. Mm -hmm. But if if I keep it so they're at least healthy green they're not dealing with <laughs> root rot which right is better anyway but you know they're, they're not you know baking out there in the sun will help a lot i do have some eucalyptus that mm. are on the back area of the house mm -hmm. um, they're about 100 feet away i'm i've taken two down um mm. only because they weren't in great shape i was worried about the way they would fall if they end up yeah. falling yeah. And if in case of a massive fire, yeah, they usually don't fall, but they start losing branches and such. And I right. want that as far away from the house yeah. as possible. Yeah. Plus, the, the uh, sprinkler system, yeah, is uh, is your your is a great way to have around the house, and that's why mm. I'm keeping all that maintained. I see. I'm pretty close to the fire station. They have a direct access to the site. I do have the well that's on energy storage, so if they have to pull from the the tank from the well mm, I see as well so yeah. uh, it, it's it's uh it's still scary though because you never know <laughs> so you do the best you can yeah. so I wanted to give a, a shout out to some mentors in my life and some thanks sure. so um my aunt Barb and Ruth uh that's the far left they really mm -hmm. you know a great understanding when I was growing up regarding native animals and plants mm. they're both passed on um unfortunately mm. but they worked quite extensively for the um, bird populations of California down into yeah. Mexico. Uh, wow. they, they worked on, uh, as a passion project, they tagged hummingbirds mm. with butterfly populations. Mm -hmm. so they were very outdoorsy, outgoing, always had a camera in their hand and mm. really appreciated what would come to sight. And this is up in, right next to UCR, mm -hmm. They can see with their property. Um, they used to tell me about the, the family of foxes that would come down from the hills every season. Oh, wow. just have new, you know, pups in their yard because they mm. had the where mm -hmm. else is kind of the, the grass lawns. Uh, Robert Cross, my dad's great friend. He uh, he was really big into owl boxes and bees populations. That's his site there. Mm. Um, fortunately, he uh, just recently had to sell his house. Um, because, oh had some medical trouble and needed mm. to be close to the family. But uh, yeah, he was always out there in the yard. He actually built my owl box, which I have. In the oh. um, UCR reserves for the time I spent out there. This is actually the first solar system I built with my dad. Oh, wow. It was, uh, it was a long time ago. I must have been about 13 when I put this together. Oh, my God. <laughs> um, nice, exciting. And then my dad, um, I didn't want to include pictures of people without their permission. They get back to me yeah. in time, but uh, <laughs> sustainable infrastructure and electrical creativity. My dad in, invented a lot for the industry. Uh, he never took out patents on things because um, he always liked to see it grow. And uh, so mm -hmm. a lot of the original racking and designs and stuff were, were my dad's mm. uh, work. And uh, he really got me to appreciate you don't need to do it perfectly you just need to toy with it and you'll yeah. get it and uh yeah. so a lot of projects where I'm like I don't know maybe I'll call someone he's like no no, no we can do it you know let, let's figure <laughs> out what needs to happen you know and do it right and do it with quality um so I really appreciate the ability to tinker that my dad uh gave well, me I'm sure you know, but you are really fortunate to be surrounded by these people who gave you so much inspiration and support. Absolutely. And I will yeah. say there is so much to say with the internet now, there's so much great, so many great resources out there. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I can't listen them all here, but I'm constantly on YouTube 
middle of the yeah. night and yes. ponds in the UK. And yeah. what do you do when you're building an earth ship? And, and they're so <laughs> fascinating. You know, we, yeah. we are all students until, you know, that uh -huh. last day where we, we leave this earth. Um, I totally there's agree. There's so much to learn. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing all this wonderful things that you're doing to your home. It's it's very inspiring, Brandon. And I'm so grateful that you spent the time with me today. Well, thank you for having me. And I, I hope you. that your viewers got something out of this. <laughs> thank you so much. Well, this was Izumi Tanaka with Home Green Home. Thank you so much, Brandon. And until the next episode. Thank you very much.